Hi, everyone. Welcome to the International Humanistic Management Association's Lunch and Learn for February 2020. Today, our guest is Elizabeth Castillo. She is going to talk about Rethinking Resources, a Path to More Humanistic Management. But first, uh, just I'm going to introduce myself because I'm the moderator. I'm Jennifer Hancock. I'm the founder of Humanist Learning Systems and a board member for the USA chapter of um, the International Humanistic Management Association. And our guest is also one of our board members. Elizabeth, take it away. Hi, everyone. I'm Elizabeth Castillo, an assistant professor at Arizona State University. I teach organizational leadership, and I'm a board member of the Humanistic Management Association. Welcome today, and thank you so much for joining us. So, Elizabeth, um, why don't we just get started, and uh, you can share your screen, and we'll start talking about how to rethink our resources um, and to do more social accounting. Okay, great. Can you see it now? Yes. Wonderful. Okay. Um, and before I get started, I want to give a big shout out to everyone from Sacramento State that's joining us. I'm curious to hear how we got on your radar screen, but we are very happy that you're here. Thank you. Um, so, the, why did I start ex thinking about resources more expansively? Um, I come from the nonprofit sector, I've spent many years there, and what we saw was this focus on financial resources alone promoted this economistic mindset where people confused profit as an end rather than recognizing it's really a means to a better life. Um, and that in turn promotes short-term thinking and sees people as a cost rather than as the purpose of an economy to begin with. And also, it does not differentiate how a profit was made. Um, so whether through value creation, that you're creating benefit for society, or you're extracting benefit. Um, and so the model that I do is when we only look at the economy through the lens of financial capital, it's like Maslow's Law of the Hammer. If all you see that as your resource or a tool, then every problem looks like a nail to you. So you lose creative capacity um, and it really works against the purposes you're trying to achieve. Um, the logical, so I thought, what is the solution to this? And it is to start thinking about resources more expansively. So in terms of our economy, whereas the balance sheet tells us that it's uh, only financial and manufacturer resources that account, um, or the count, what we know is, well, people are the heart of the economy and they're the purpose of the economy. Um, and then it's our relationships with each other. How do we interact? Um, and then how do we choose to organize? So we can organize hierarchically, we can have matrix um, structures. And then what are the stories and the mental models that undergird this? Um, and then most importantly to recognize that we are not in, um, you know, just, it's not just about humans, but we're embedded in nature itself. Um, what uh, Giddens uh, says, information, matter, and energy are the sources of all resources. Um, and then also recognizing the important, uh, importance of time, um, whether we're looking at short term or long term. And collectively, um, the economist uh, in 1944, Karl Polanyi, he, he called about this uh, embeddedness, that you have to look at the economy holistically, all these different dimensions. And by doing this, we can have a more holistic sense of ourselves. Um, and humanistic management offers us a way to reintegrate ourselves with our systems. And then for those of you familiar with the economist um, Mart uh, Martia Sen and uh, Martha Nussbaum, the philosopher, these capitals, um, which is how what social accounting looks at them as, are really a proxy for capabilities, the development of human potential. So we're going to talk about that a little bit more. Um, so social accounting offers a way to look at the economy and our organizations more holistically. It does include the financial measures still, but it also supports other types of quantitative measures as well as qualitative measures, such as analysis and descriptions, stories, icons, and graphs, graphics. And not just from the organization's perspective, however, it also includes the multiple stakeholder perspective so that we start seeing our organization more embedded in these nested layers of systems. 
And there's many types of um, social accounting, but the one that really resonates with me that I use is integrated reporting. And its model is rooted in these six forms of capital, financial, manufactured, intellectual, human, relational, and natural. And then those are inputs that um, a firm then uses to create outcomes, out outputs and outcomes through its business activities, which then create organizational and systemic transformation. And if you do it strategically, your outputs then recycle back to become new inputs into the system. So for example, a firm that invests in human capital by developing its employees and giving them leadership opportunities Get, produces more committed employees who then stay with the company, reducing their um, recruitment costs and increasing employee engagement and productivity levels. So it's really the, the basis for a circular economy, both within the organization and um, beyond. And so here are some examples of the integrated reporting. Um, it has the description of each of the type of the capitals and then why, what are the value we created? So looking at human, um, they focus on human creativity, both in terms of process de improvement, design, and development of new improved services. Um, because at the heart of every company, it's, it is its people at the end of the day that are driving its value creation capacity. Um, an integrated reporting shines a light on people and also looks at it in relation to all the other types of resources. Um, so an exemplar report here in the United States that I really like is the Indiana Society of CP, uh, Certified Professional Accountants. Um, they have for the last six years put out an integrated report and they show how these different types of inputs um, are, are developed through their activities, and then what are the outputs and outcomes they create. And so painting a more holistic picture of these various types of resources and why they matter, how they help produce uh, value, and, and that creates a business case for why they merit investment in. And um, so integrated reporting is an international um, phenomenon and it uh, was first began at South Africa. It was, it's mandated there for any company listed on the stock exchange, um, as well as Brazil, it's mandatory. And Japan has recently, uh, the government has recommended that its companies start using integrated reporting model um, to more holistically look at the different um, types of resources that, that go into value creation for companies. Um, however, when they developed the model, they did not have, the in an International Integrated Reporting Council did not have any sociologists on their uh, panel. And so in my mind, they're missing a few capitals. Um, and we're gonna go into those today in a little bit more. And that's the other types of relational capital, uh, namely political and spiritual. And then we have the symbolic dimension, which we're talking about narrative and culture. Um, and then the structural, that we have choices how we organize and those choices can either enable or constrain um, human development potential. Um, so let's dive into that. Um, by thinking in capitals, we can kind of see a more holistic picture where the, it, it, I call it the wheel of wealth creation, where wealth is construed in terms of well-being. What does it take to have a robust economy and well-being for people, organizations, and societies? Um, and so each of these has examples of uh, what you can do to develop. Um, and we're going to go into each, each one a little bit more here. So for example, with human capital, um, I look at this more in terms of what can a manager do to develop human capital. And so while it's interesting to think of human capital as an overarching construct, it can also be really helpful to dive down and see what are the dimensions of human capital. And so for example, you wanna talk about physiological, um, where we talk about employee wellness, for example. Um, and is, uh, then psychological is also an important dimension. So for example, um, Google had a, a research project called Project Aristotle, 
which was how do, what makes for an effective team. And they thought it was going to be like having the smartest people on the team. And what they found out is that was not the case at all. It was this dimension called psychological safety. Um, and did people feel trust and support among their team members so that it was safe to speak up and um, tell your truth without being shot down or, or shamed? Um, and so that gets into things like power differentials. Um, and so integrative reporting and in this um, psychological dimension of human capital offers a way to shine a light on these important things that can either um, promote value creation or inhibit it, um, team effectiveness and, and therefore value creation. Um, another company that I really am, admire a lot is Dr. Bronner's Magic Soap. They are based in San Diego. Um, so this was a, a recent social media post they put up. They call it constructive capitalism. Um, but they look, they paid, their minimum wage is $19.23, so they pay a living wage. But they also, they attend to equity and power differences. So they cap the difference between the, the lowest wage earner and the highest wage earner with a five to one gap. Um, and then they also offer free health insurance both to the staff and their families, recognizing that employee and family well-being is pivotal um, both to uh, employee well-being but also organizational effectiveness. Um, and so for anything that you're interested in developing, there are ways to measure it. And these are some examples of how a company, Sassol, is measuring human capital. Um, and so rather than focusing on a singular measure, it really is important for the company to think about what is important to them. Often, though, that looks at things like attitude and employee satisfaction, length of tenure um, and turnover. Um, and then what kind of learning and development you're doing for your employees. Um, now we'll move on to relational capital, which includes social, political, and spiritual. I know we had a, a, a question about spiritual, so that is part of my model. Um, but first, uh, one of the things I teach in my class on this is why does social capital matter? Yes, it's nice to have good relationships, but it turns out there's a whole science about why relationships are important and how they help create value for companies. And so it has to do a lot with this spread and sharing of information. Information. So if you trust people, you're more likely to share information. And when you feel threatened, you can start keeping information to yourself and it can create silos and turfdoms and, and really create problems for organizations. Um, it can also, good social capital can also create a sense of shared purpose and identity, um, which then enhances re, um, reputation. And then these are not just effects at the organizational or individual level. They have macro um, societal in, uh, implications. So when you develop um, social capital in, in your relationships and create these networks of strong social capital, you create the systemic properties of social cohesion, which creates stability um, and, and ha helps a society go forward collectively. Um, and the key to social cohesion is this notion of reciprocity, is that you're doing win-win mentality and transactions um, versus extractive and, and parasitic models. Um, where one person's winning comes at the expense of someone else's. And so a case example that I love and that I use in my class um, to show how these um, multiple capital show up in organizations, um, Raffaele at uh, Harvard did this fantastic research. How did independent bookstores reinvent themselves in the face of disruption by Amazon? So we know a lot of the big box bookstores went out of um, uh, business. Well, why didn't the little ones? Um, because they were able to create social capital. He called them the three C's, convening, community and curation by being creating relationships with customers and really being at service to them. And so they became known as these anchors of authenticity, which is what people are craving in this world and that Amazon can never compete with, right, by creating these localized experiences and connecting. So this is an example of how social capital shows up in a business model. 
Um, and then we look at the, you know, social capital is not just, it can be positive, but all of these capitals can have positive or negative expressions, just like our bank balance, right? And so for the negative expressions of social capital, you get this in terms of alienation, loneliness, isolation at the individual level. But over collectively at the macro level, this turns into social polarization um, where people are marginalized. Um, and it constrains autonomy and then gets people to check out and even start harming their society, um, which I think is a lot of what's going on in our, our world today. Um, and so by attending to social capital, you can create these, um, it's an antidote to some of these um, social polarization and social ills we're experiencing. Um, so it's important to think about these multiple capitals at multiple levels. You can develop in the, the individual level, the organizational level, and the, the global and societal level. Um, and then, you know, there are ways that you can foster trust, um, and the literature offers some resources about, you know, what creates trustworthy leaders and how to create relationships with your stakeholders um, in terms of transparency, for example, being one strategy. Um, and here's a website um, now that kind of gets starts getting into what does spiritual capital look like in practice. And so this is a, a company called Bain and Company, and they did this research to show what are the uh, fundament the foundations of value creation. And they their research framed it in terms of Maslow's hierarchy of needs. So I encourage you all to go to the website and check it out because on each of these little bubbles it will pull up a box that tells what the, what the value is and then what kind of industries you see it used in. But the highest level of, is, a, is a self transcendence where you get into relationships with something greater than yourself, um, helping people and society more broadly. Um, they use the example of Tom's. I think um, we see it in many types of businesses um, where you're in you even company or uh, movements like conscious capitalism, where you're trying to have a higher purpose and business is more a means to create this, this global collective good. Um, and then we'll get into symbolic capital. Um, so spatial capital is one of the things, um, we see it in terms of, of car dealerships that aggregate together um, using spatial, cap their spatial proximity as a, a resource. And we also see it in companies like um, Starbucks that has um, sought to take a storefront and turn it into a community gathering space, what they call their third space, to create a sense of community and belonging where um, people feel connected rather than isolated and disjointed. And then in terms of our companies, um, cultural capital, where we can attend to how are the patterns of relationships within our organization. Um, and there are also ways to, to measure this. So this is something that all organizations should be attending to. Uh, and lastly, we'll get to the structural capital. Um, and so one, we have choices with how we organize, right? So we can either do it like through command and control where the people at the top give the orders and they everybody at, at the bottom just has to do what they're told. Or um, there's models like um, Doug Kirkpatrick, who was our guest on this um, webinar about six months ago, where he talked about how um, Morningstar Farms had developed these self-managed work teams. And through mutual commitments that these teams made to each other through a chartering process, they um, activated the autonomy of people within the teams to figure out what it was that needed to be done and then where they were authorized to do it. So it, it um, promoted much more of a sense of ownership um, in the companies. Um, and then we had a question about leadership, uh, some questions. And so what um, integrated reporting model and these this multiple capitals is showing the importance of attending to processes like communication and leadership and how um, these um, new ways of thinking and being can really promote more, more, more personal effectiveness, uh, which then leads to, to larger organizational effectiveness. And, and then of course, social benefit.
Uh, and then governance, um, and we see um, rule of law, uh, how a company governs, uh, because if they're asleep at the wheel, so for example, like Enron um, or Wells Fargo, those were really, you, you talk about the business model failure, but it was really governance asleep at the wheel that they were not paying attention. And so the social accounting model offers a way to shine a light and pay attention to um, these governance and rule of law aspects that are that can really uh, make or break an organization. And um, real the, quick, Elizabeth, um, for everybody who's asking, yes, she has this as a PDF. Yes, we will be putting it on the website and you will have access to all of this because I'm also going, wait, I wanna go back to two slides ago. So all of this will be available on the website. Continue, and Elizabeth. <laughs> thank you, and I do appreciate your patience. Um, I know this is a lot, a lot, I frequently get the feedback this like drinking out of a fire hose. Um, the important thing though is that it is important to see the holistic picture because there's a lot of people that concentrate on one of the capitals, but it's really seeing them together. And so, for example, the um, this shows how social accounting offers a way to link values, vision, mission, strategic objectives, and KPIs in an integrated way so that you are having this holistic sense of value creation. Um, and it also invites us to d dive more deeply and be reflective so that we're not just reacting to surface events like a pinball, um, but we really are starting to be able to anticipate and see patterns and trends and then recognize what are the underlying structures that are either enhancing or thwarting our value creation potential. And then what are the stories that we're telling ourselves? Um, and so that's one reason the humanistic management um, association exists is um, the story that right now that we are, are given is this economistic model that you know pro it's all about profit and then if we make profit everybody else will be good um, and what uh, humanistic management offers us is a new mental model to start thinking about um, resources and more expansively and th that the purpose of economy is really about people not just about profit and collectively, when you adopt this more holistic mindset, you can show how paying attention to people, planet, and profit through an integrated business model promotes well-being for all of these in, in ways that then produce systemic impacts and um, advance the sustainable development goals. Um, so that's another thing I like about social accounting is it shows how these um, micro, local micro actions can ultimately create um, a better world um, by feeding into these sustainable development goals. And ideally, um, you would use the, the multiple capitals model to be thinking about individual development. So how, what kind of capitals do your employees need to be developing um, for our organizations? Uh, at the community level, we could use these as community well-being indicators. Um, I know Santa Monica, for example, uses a community well-being, and a lot of uh, uh, cities in Canada also are using this. Um, but by linking the levels together, then we start seeing how can they synergistically produce well-being. Um, and so the takeaway is that when we use a multiple capitals model, we end up able to create an economy that's rooted in reciprocity rather than extractive um, parasitism. And that we can do it in a strategic way that where it does produce profits and some of these are cycled back to become new inputs. So we create this circular economy. Um, and this is important because how we create value ultimately also create the values that our world is founded upon because economic exchange is constitutive. It's not just instrumental. It shapes the power relations of how we interact and either um, thwarts or fosters our, our human development. Um, and so I'll also leave you with a bunch of resources so you can continue your learning journey. And I invite you to um, join the International Humanistic Management S um, Association, subscribe to our list so that you could stay involved. Wow, okay, so <laughs> my mind is, was like, whoa. Okay, so again, this is going to be um, available on the website and once we've got the video done, we'll 
do it like we always do. We'll post the video and all the links and all the resources she just re referenced, as well as this PDF to the website and give you that information. Um, real quick, Georgia, I'm hoping, I see that you're on. I'm hoping that maybe you can act as the moderator for the group for us because you're active in the chat. Um, Elizabeth, I want to start with you and ask you <laughs> a couple of questions from a little bit back and then we'll open it up for everybody because I know we've got a lot of questions. Okay. Um, it dawned on me as you were talking about the social accounting part um, that, you know, the CPAs have this as an integrated model or some group of CPAs does and they're starting to use this. But I, it seems like a CPA on their own within an organization would not have the information to be able to create an integrated report that they would have to pull other people in in order to get all the information to create that integrated report. So are there examples of this that people are doing and how would one create this sort of cross-functional team to even do this sort of reporting? Um, great question. And so another group I'm involved with is the International Integrated Reporting Council, and they have interviewed um, the Indiana CPA Society. So there's a webinar on that. But basically, it is creating an ad hoc team to start working on this um, because you do need to pull information from the various departments. And um, what they found over time is it's really become an organizational development tool because it promotes this cross-departmental understanding and communication instead of silos where one department just operates in its own little bubble. It starts to understand how the different departments are related in terms of value creation um, synergistic Perfect. So I guess the next question I have is, is this, um, is this doable like within a department? Like if you don't have organizational buy-in and you are in your own little silo, um, can you do this within your silo as a way to help the organization understand the benefits of it? Yes, I think that actually is the way to start if you're not getting traction. So for example, I was trying to get this taken up at ASU and it has been slow going um, at the, the global level. And so I have taken that exact track where, okay, I'm just going to start with my department because that's where I have influence, right? And start framing um, some of our conversations in terms of these uh, multiple capitals. Um, because a lot of times you'll see where organizations are stuck, it's a deficit of one of these capitals. So either, you know, the people don't have training, so that's human capital, or um, a lot of times it's the social capital or the cultural capital, right? Um, and um, one of the pitfalls I think we fall into is wanting to measure these right away. I think before we can get to measurement, we have to have language and start talking about a framework holistically. Um, and so what this offers us is a model with a rationale and business case to show how these multiple resources affect the outcomes that we're trying to produce. Awesome. Okay, so my final question before we have Georgia unmute herself and start asking questions from the chat room is um, you mentioned a couple places where there are videos for training. Um, as I'm listening to you, I really want you to do an online course for my company. <laughs> um, but it, it's pretty clear that people need training on this um, or could benefit from this. I mean, certainly they could look at the model and muddle along but it seems like training would be better. So where is the training and is it available yet or is it being created or? So I'm working on a book right now, or I'm working on a book proposal. Um, so, and to kind of put the story and it's based on a class that I'm teaching. Um, but in the meantime, on the resources list, um, all four of the big uh, public accounting firms, so KPMG, um, Ernst Young, they have all put out publications on integrated reporting. And those are listed in the references um, document that'll be part of the PowerPoint. Um, so the links, that so that would be a good starting point. And then to take a look at the Indiana CPA Society, to me, that is the most approachable and clearest example that I've found um, in the United States. Perfect. Um, Georgia, if you want to um, unmute yourself and start um, asking the questions from the, um, the chat room, that would be perfect. Sure, sure. Yeah, so one of the first questions, Elizabeth, was from Ravi, and it was, what is the optimal balance across all six types of capital at the various levels of aggregation? And then 
They had another question that said, how do you also avoid the tragedy of commons? I don't know if you can answer both those questions. Um, I will, uh, first of all, uh, talk about the, the, there's no right answer for the first question. It really is contingent and dependent upon what the needs of that organization is for its local context. Um, and it's one of the reasons I like the integrated reporting model compared to standards-based models like GRI, um, the Global Reporting Index, or the Sustainable Accounting um, Standards Board, because those have are very prescriptive in what you should be measuring measuring and you risk being out of tune with what are the needs of your organization. Integrated reporting is a principles-based model. Um, it gives you the, the, the architecture for what you should be paying attention to, but what the, how that shows up in your organization, you need to figure out. Um, and that's through conversations and, and becoming familiar with what it is that actually creates uh, value for your organization. And I'm sorry, what was the second part of that question, Georgia? How do you avoid the tragedy of commons? Um, well, so that is why it's important to get to, um, well, I'm going to keep going because I actually have a model. Is, uh, has anybody heard of Eleanor Ostrom, um, who she argued um, and provide empirical support for how organizations can avoid the tragedy of the commons? And so she has these eight design principles. Um, and it's basically creating an architecture where people can self-organize to figure out what needs to be done without having these overly prescriptive um, rules. So the tragedy of the commons that um, Georgia is referring to is um, in the context of, of um, common pool resources like an aquifer or a watershed or a pasture, um, the, the co conventional narrative is that people will screw it up um, because inevitably some people will be greedy and use more than their share and so the, the um, resource will be eroded. And what Eleanor Ostrom's research did was show that actually no that is not true um, oh and so Hardin's solution was oh and that's why we either have to do private ownership so everybody can um, we can get rid of the commons and people can just take care of their own little piece or you need government intervention um, and Eleanor Ostrom's work, or work from her empirical research around the world showed that no, in fact, people for centuries, millennia, have been managing these resources very effectively. And she identified eight common themes for what, are the, what needs to be in place for this effective management. And these are the eight principles. So for, to answer the second part of the question, I would suggest visiting Eleanor Ostrom's eight design principles. Um, David Sloan Wilson, his magazine Evo Economics has a fantastic article, um, The Woman Who Saved Economics, um, who lays out this in a very, in a very clear and lay-friendly um, way. Great. Thank you. Mm -hmm. And then I see, because I didn't see Robbie, I couldn't see if he was on the video, but um, I see German Adelora is on. Do you want to unmute yourself and ask your question directly? He's trying. I can see him. Okay. Well, anyway, his question was, since you take a general systems approach, how do you account for negative entropy? Um, so are you talking about negative externalities? Um, so. Yeah, because he's talking. Can you unmute him, Jen, as an admin? German Otelora, because I see he's speaking. Yeah, go ahead. Okay, thank you. Yeah, no, I'm thinking from the perspective of general system theory. In general system theory, every system is subject to negative entropy, which means that uh, in using energy and information, you don't get optimal resources. There's, there are always uh, degradating forces called negative entropy that you have to face and you have to account for, not everything is positive. There are also negative trends. Right. Um, so yeah, thank you for, for um, clarifying that. So basically that is where the notion of development comes from. And so how can you aggregate these resources in ways that you're creating a, um, a developmental trend versus a degrading trend? 
Um, and so uh, the other research, this gets a little nerdy, but um, Howard Odom's um, notion of ecological, I'm gonna stop sharing with you, of um, maximum empower, where he talks about creating higher qualities of energy um, that is a framework to show uh, you want to keep a system open-ended so that it continuously develops um, and that way it can um, counter the, t the tendency toward negative entropy. Thank you. And then I don't know if, Daniela, are you on and you can unmute yourself? If not, I'll ask her a question. Yeah, um, I gave you co-hosting, Georgia, so you can unmute them. Yeah, I just don't know if she's on or not because her video isn't on. Anyway, what she was saying is something interesting because all you're saying obviously assumes that managers care and want to make a difference. But what she was saying is that the IIRC clearly prioritizes financial capital. So how can a capital's approach disrupt the capitalist return on capital perspective like how can you switch the mindset i think is mostly yeah. what she's trying to get to um that is a great question and it is a fair criticism i mean i understand um and i actually get it michael pearson in our own group um you know kind of uh, call, calls me on the use of capitals right um but i think if you take this larger framing seeing capitals as a proxy for capabilities and it really does come down to human capabilities development where you are giving freedom and autonomy for people to develop in their own ways and then co and then coordinate so that they can create this cooperative Operative surplus um, and, and uh, 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 societal value, organizational and societal value. Um, so what she's talking about, there are certain organizations where this is never going to fly because and I, I finance companies, I think, tend to be some of the worst people that are too locked into their mental model of what an economy is about. But increasingly, we see companies like Patagonia, um, B corporations, for example. George, I know you're doing a lot of work on showing how the Italian companies are really embracing this um, this more expansive mental model and so what um, the this um, modified version of integrated reporting is trying to take into account these other dimensions like spiritual capital um, to show how they can help keep an organization um, in tune with its local operating environment in a way that still enables the production of profit and cooperative surplus for continuous social development can I kind of jump in on this really quick? As you were talking about capitals equals capabilities, I'm really attracted to that because I think the current accounting is just capital equals money. Right. And, you know, when you start thinking of capitals as capabilities, it's a lot easier to think about, okay, money is one of our capabilities. Um, humans are another of our capabilities. The natural resources are another of our our capabilities and it start you start thinking in terms of possibilities when you start talking about capabilities and so the whole mindset of that to me i'm like digging it <laughs> so <laughs> thank Anyways. you and it it speaks to uh, German's question too about this negative entropy because if you only focus on one type of resource, you end up cutting off those possibilities and that over time the system will decay, um, which is what his point was, I think. But by taking this capabilities developmental mindset, you keep the, you expand the possibilities of both the people and the system um, so you can um, escape the cycle of this neg negative entropy, the decay. Yeah, Ravi, can you unmute yourself like so you can ask the question more specifically? Because I didn't outline it as you meant it. I was really asking about the trade-offs among those six sources of capital. Obviously, when you're trying to create value, you need certain sets of uh, uh, sources of capital. You need time, you need knowledge, you need uh, capital, you need people. Uh, and there are trade-offs among the sources of capital that you deploy to create something of value. So, and that question is not addressed because we all live in uh, boxes, meaning we all live in resource-constrained worlds. We don't have infinite resources to draw on. So given that uh, we are limited in how much uh, access how much capital we can access, whatever those six sources are, 
I, I'm not very clear about those trade-offs. We, we are limited. We, we all live in boxes. Yes. So, the world I, power, for example. I can only solve it, the world. You raise a, a great point, Robbie. So that um, the there are trade offs. Um, so you know that we do live in a world of resource scarcity. That's where the field of economics comes from, right? But a lot of times we limit ourselves to false trade offs because of our framing of a situation. And so, for example, a cost benefit um, example in higher education. Um, they just came out with a report here in Arizona. Um, the community. Uh, uh, the Chamber of Commerce uh, saying that it wasn't worth it uh, because it was going to cost more than any benefits that would um, be uh, panned out over a 10 year period. Well, that was their framing, a 10 year period. But we know from the literature that higher education pays off over generations of because what one generation does has long term consequences and that it also creates not just benefits for the person, but um, communities that have higher levels of college graduates also have more parent involvement in schools, they have a higher tax base, they have a more prepared workforce. So um, it's the micro and the macro levels. Uh, and that's, um, this model doesn't offer solutions per se, but it helps to expand the framing so that at least you're recognizing what the options are so that you're not getting locked into these false trade-offs that our current cost benefit mentality um, finds us in so often. Yeah, I, I actually have one, a couple questions that came up. The first is, you know, you say that they've been working on self-managed teams. And I've been studying, yeah, Italian companies that do that. But the, the problem with the whole benefit movement in general and um, the self-managed teams and how they get confused, but is that the... You said, for example, yeah, you're not a fan of the GRI. So integrated reporting is perfect because it balances both sides. Now, what happens is, for example, benefit corporations, teal, flourishing enterprises, except for Patagonia, like the big ones, or it's a known, like they're doing a really good job. But the smaller ones don't have reporting that can be compared or worked on, like what they come up with has like no structure. So do you think that integrated, like they shouldn't go through the step of doing sustainable reporting and the just step, you know, from benefit corporation to integrated reporting directly? Um, I think that, so it's important to recognize that this has two values, right? One is a reporting value to stakeholders and investors, and then there's a strategic value. So how do you develop your company um, so that you can develop these multiple types of capabilities? Um, so I don't think it's that they shouldn't do it. I think um, getting to Ravi's point, it's a trade-off, like how onerous is it to do the GRI versus the value you're getting from it? Um, recognizing it's not just about um, putting the space on to, to your stakeholders through the ESG reporting, but also that the reporting needs to be meaningful um, to your own organization and not lock you into, I mean, I think that's kind of how Wells Fargo got into the, it, the whole, right, is it was so focused on the financial reporting to its stakeholders that it lost sight of um, the ethical dimensions that really, um, at, at the operational level. Um, integrated reporting offers a way to have both. Okay, no, I agree, but the, the, yeah, because they, they're not doing a really good job as reporting to stakeholders as opposed to the great impact that they actually have. Right. Anyways, question, because it's the first time I see it in a more international context, is the whole idea of reciprocity. Because one thing that we argue here is that we call it gratuity, but I know it has a different meaning in US or in Anglo-Saxon in general. And they call it graciousness or something in English. But they were saying that reciprocity is very dangerous in companies because, again, be controlled by management because it's just, you know, a gesture that I might do today and I might not do tomorrow and that might help someone, you know. And do you think that could actually be integrated in some way, like a reciprocity factor? Um, that's a good question, and I think that would get down to culture, right, is what are your patterns of relating? And um, like any positive thing, um, like technology, it can be turned into a weapon, right? Um, so reciprocity can become a um, transactional tit-for-tat type of, of thing. Um, I think what I'm offering is if you take reciprocity at its true heart, um, if you're really 
focusing a, an economy based on care, uh, of where genuine concern for people and trying to develop their well-being. Um, and so then the ex reciprocal exchange will be natural, not um, an artifice. Okay. And I do, Georgia, I love the idea of graciousness instead of reciprocity, but um, <laughs> You know, that's just me. Real quick with everybody who's participating, my company, Humanist Learning Systems, does offer a certificate of completion for, or certificate of participation for this. Um, we have a SHRM approved certificate, a general certificate. HRCI has not yet given us approval for this yet, but it's pending. So if you need an HRCI certificate, go ahead and tell us that, but it might be a few weeks before we get that to you. But if you need one, I need your first name, your last name, and your email and which of the certificates, and you can have more than one that you want, the general, the HRCI, or the SHRM. Understanding the HRCI won't come right away, but go ahead and put that in the chat. Georgia, continue on. Oh, oh excuse me, can I just say that the certificates are free? This is just a service that Jen's company offers, um, you know, pro bono, so um, take advantage of it. <laughs> Yeah, no, I I just saw there was another question, but I'm not sure I understand it. I don't know if Alexander Gonzalez, are you on? Can you ask your question? Because he was saying how, why you think so many. Oh yeah, these... so, uh, so yeah, go ahead. recently I just, uh, I was on social media and I just saw all these major CEOs uh, have stepped down from um, chairman. And I was just wondering if there is like some type of, um, because with like government, you're talking about government intervention. And I was just wondering, like the board of directors and if there's an, has there been like some mis, uh, like unregulated things going on with that, for that many people to step down out of um, being CEO? Um, I would say it's less to do with government regulation and more to do with the um, shareholders becoming more advocates for this um, environmental, social, and government ESG um, ethos, um, where we're starting to recognize that, that value creation comes through these multiple dimensions. And so... Um, CEOs that have this mental model of that it's all about financial, uh, they're, they're the ones whose companies are imploding a lot of times, um, like Enron or Wells Fargo. Um, and so I think those might be the ones that are getting the boot and, and trying to come out with more inclusive CEOs that are, are more in this ESG mindset. Uh, thank you. Mm -hmm. I have one last question, actually. Um, so I, I, I wrote it on the chat before, they have just launched the, the SDG Action Manager. This was like super recent, like it happened, I think less than a month ago. And, uh, and so now basically it's it works like a specific corporation, like the benefit impact assessment, but you can measure your company um, strategy basically against the SDGs, which companies weren't doing before. Now, my only thing was that I mean, I went to their first webinar, so I'm not really sure how the tool works, but then they're still lacking. First of all, it's very voluntary, so it's very personal, and you don't really need a solution. And second of all, um, there's, again, no reporting. It doesn't help for reporting. What, what, what do you think is, like, the leap? I think we're missing a leap, for, especially for smaller companies. What do you think they should be doing? Because I think they're really lacking this, this like, building block. Yeah, I agree that it's not, um, most companies can't just go to what are they doing for the SDGs, right? I mean, it's, it, um, so that's why I, another reason I'm a fan of this integrated reporting model, because if you start talking about these multiple forms of resources and then showing how they lead to like better um, use of natural capital and um, better, more positive versus negative externalities, that will get you the linkage to the SDGs. But you cannot start out with your business model and go straight to the SDGs um, because that's not the, the purpose of the firm, right? You need these intermediary steps and I see these multiple capitals as being the building blocks of capabilities development and SDG delivery. It's like the SDGs are an emergent property, um, just like um, 
I think about birds and flock formation. You can't make a flock, right? But through the in individual bird actions, a flock forms. The SDGs are very much like this larger global pattern that will emerge as companies um, take these individualized action steps in terms of the multiple capitals. Right, but it's only through the reporting that they can actually keep track of what right. they're doing. And the, the, that's why having some sort of dashboard, I know um, one of our people, um, Kevin Loveless had asked about, you know, technology as a change of it in leadership. And I do see creating some sort of dashboard where companies are tracking these on a daily basis in real time, um, uh, both individually and collectively um, will help um, people pay attention to these um, so they can get to the SDGs. Yeah. Because then, yeah, for the SDG action manager, you can actually choose like which SDGs your company will focus on because it obviously depends. Right. And then, well, can I, can I jump in with a really quick, well, not a quick question, but um, as I'm listening to the two of you discuss this, I'm thinking, gosh, this might actually even be a useful tool to, for an individual creating their own goals within their organization or as an, at an individual level for what I want to do in the world. Um, through my work, even if it's not something the organization does, I can still maybe use this tool to help me think about how I'm working both in my private life and my professional life. Is that, have you seen Absolutely. anybody use it that way? <laughs> Absolutely. They haven't been yet, but that's one, when you look at the fractal model, how you individual, organizational, community, at the individual level, I, I would like to see students and all employees using that as part of their professional development plan, right? And so the training often will get to the intellectual side, like what are they learning? Um, but you also, well, they need to have a network, like a social network, right? Um, and that's where a lot of my students who are graduating, they have the knowledge now, uh, but they don't have the social networks. And so by using the integrated reporting framework, the multiple capitals perspective, they can see where their opportunities for improvement are um, and then work on developing those, re those intangible resources. Yeah, Daniela had an integration. Do you wanna ask for it yourself? I saw her come up on video. Yeah, hello. Um, thanks for the interesting talk. I um, I was wondering for the integrated or that is one one initiative, the integrated reporting framework that claims that you, it's looking at different aspects and therefore more integrative and promoting well-being for communities or like everyone basically. Um, what what are your thoughts on uh, the impact on on groups like on people or environment that are not considered a part of the capitals like they don't have a voice in all that framework right um, well um, ideally they do because that's why it adopts this stakeholder um, uh, perspective, right? The problem is that, like, what do you mean by a stakeholder? So if, um, under the way the project management looks at stakeholders, they only pay attention to the powerful stakeholders, right? And what you're talking about is how do people without voice and power, how are their perspectives integrated into it? Um, and so there's no perfect solution, but I am publishing an article right now on how to take more of a systems perspective of stakeholders and create pathways for uh, people without power and voice to have um, a, 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 an input into organizations. And ultimately, um, you see companies, um, social enterprises really trying to take these disempowered people and give them voice. So um, in Arizona, we have a company called Televerde who's working with incarcerated women to um, do workforce development. And then they actually get hired by the company after they're out and, um, and it reintegrated into society. And so, um, I think that's another challenge that of mental models we have to come is that the powerless are to be pushed aside and ma marginalized versus how can we integrate them into our operations. And I think that's a lot of what social enterprises are trying to do. Yeah, um, yeah, the Ger German was making a comment. Um, yeah, I have one last question because we have like two minutes left. But then how important do you think in order to achieve like that mindset is like spirituality because people always tie spirituality to religion but it's not necessarily like it's just a more spiritual like it's more, it brings people to consciousness and just take care of the surroundings because people in companies tend to just focus on their objectives and not to the people to me 
Georgia, the spirituality is the key. And as I define it in my class, because I do teach it as one of the capitals in a public university, um, religion is one expression of it, right? But there's also a sense of higher purpose, or it's basically being in relation to, to something beyond yourself. Um, it can be ancestors, it can be nature, it, and for conscious capitalism, it's this higher sense of purpose, right? But whatever it is, um, the spiritual dimension, I say it helps us get out of our own way. Um, so often, and we get stuck in our egos and our it really limits us it, it disconnects us from each other it fragments our own sense of, of being um, by reorienting ourselves to a higher purpose whatever that means to us it really helps us expand to our full dimension of humanity so I it is one of the key um, capitals right as Mandora says from ego system to ecosystem yes exactly from ego to echo, yep. Yeah. All right, real quick uh, reminder, if you want a certificate, uh, I need your first name, your last name, your email, or I can't email it, and which certificates you want, general HRCI or SHRM, knowing that the HRCI might be delayed. Um, we have about five minutes left. Elizabeth, I would like to um, kind of focus back on the core message. If you had one major practice or idea you would like individuals to start adopting based on what we just talked about, what would that be? Uh, it would be to recognize that more resources exist than just money, paying attention to them intentionally and holistically will help us be more effective. Um, it'll get out of the law of the hammer where everything looks like a nail and we'll realize we have drills and uh, other tools at our disposal that can help us create the world that we want. To follow up on that, what is the one major thing or idea that you would want middle level managers to take away from this that they could do in their organizations? What I would love for them to do is to go to the Indiana Society of CPA, look at that integrated report and see how they can start adopting that kind of stakeholder and multiple capitals model within their organization, uh, because it is a framework for success, sustainable success over time, uh, inclusivity, uh, where you're giving people voice and, um, and developing capabilities. Um, and so that's the big starting point for me is that that report. Okay, great. And the final question is for people who are in the academic space still, who are working on uh, research, or they're trying to get their PhD, or they're teaching, what is the one main idea that you would like them to take away and integrate into their work? Um, for them, I think it would be looking at the capitals holistically. So many disciplines look at one type, like sociology will look at social capital, human capital, psychology. It's important to integrate all of the capitals and so start looking at their synergistic interaction effects um, at these multiple levels um, through the lens of like community development, for example. And that's the piece I think that's really missing is the integrated reporting model is used in the private sector, but it's like disembodied from the public sphere. And so making that link between the public and private spheres is, is essential. Perfect. Um, do you have any final thoughts you want to leave us with um, before we end the recording? And keep in mind, everybody, we will stay on for a little bit to, to have a wider conversation. Um, we just will end the recording part of it. So Elizabeth, final thoughts. Um, I just really want to thank everybody so much for taking an hour out of your day to be with us and um, learn about these new ideas and then also to build community here with the Humanistic Management Association. We really um, are grateful for your time and involvement. Thank you. All right, and we are.